And I would like to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Bill Probsting is a retired professor of horticulture, uh, lives here in Corvallis. He, he taught at OSU for 28 years. Uh, he not only gardens at home, he spends a lot of time birding, both locally, I've run into him on hikes in the area, and he also travels all around the world. He's uh, currently president of the Audubon Society of Corvallis, uh, and Bill and his wife enjoy traveling uh, sometimes together, sometimes Bill goes on trips on his own. Uh, the most recent trip, uh, and one that uh, Bill presented to the Audubon Society, last Thursday was on his trip to Bolivia. So uh, Bill tonight is going to speak on uh, gardening and birds, an ecological approach, and uh, I will now mute my mic and uh, let Bill take over the program. Uh, and uh, if people do have uh, questions uh, for Bill, then uh, use the chat function and I will do my best to uh, uh, follow those questions and, and pass them on. Bill? All right, thank you, Alan. What, did I, what an august group to speak to tonight. I'm glad I can't see you, it's, it's, it feels intimidating. All right, uh, gardening for birds is one of my interests. Uh, we're going to tonight, uh, I'm gonna offer up uh, a set of ecological principles uh, that uh, it's kind of an, a conceptual toolkit that you can apply to any situation. I'm gonna focus on uh, woodland sorts of gardens tonight. So we'll be talking about trees and shrubs primarily, exclusively actually, but the same principles apply to any situation. Uh, if you wanna set up a prairie or an oak savanna or an Amazon rainforest uh, or a shrub step, then you would do the same sorts of things. Uh, the, everybody will use these tools uh, given the site that they have, the means they have, the perception of the world that they have. And part of that perception is, well, why would I want to garden for birds? And some people simply want to uh, feed and see birds so you can improve your garden to improve that experience for the birds. Uh, and uh, gardens that uh, birds like are nice places for people too. So if you keep that in mind that you can do something for yourself. Lane and I, our standard line is that uh, we travel to nice places to see birds. Uh, some of you may be conservationists uh, and say, well, I want to devote my little patch of paradise to improving habitat for birds. And that's great. Uh, so related to that is that you may realize in any of these cases, whatever your perspective is that, gee, this is just a small piece of the world. We really need to scale this up 10 million times. Uh, we're still looking for the person that uh, can explain that to the world. So maybe they're in the audience tonight. Well, what's the problem uh, environmentally? Very quickly is that there are on the order of 8 billion humans making a living around the world. And so we inevitably uh, affect the ecosystem while we're uh, doing that so that we take large patches of forest or prairie or wetlands or what have you and break it into much smaller chunks. Each of those chunks is an island and islands tend to lose species, even big ones. Uh, in the process of modifying the land that's left, we simplify the habitat. So it's less ecologically productive, number three. And then we spread here, then we uh, have, uh, in this case, in Rome, uh, the uh, center of it uh, is up in McDonald Forest, but it is spread throughout the Oak Creek, Fit and Green, Bald Hill area. Uh, it's not just uh, slipping into the uh, environment, but it's uh, obviously taken out the entire perennial and shrub layer. So we're left with a greatly simplified so-called forest. As a result of these issues then, uh, birds are uh, declining uh, at a steady rate. You might have seen this article that got a lot of uh, publicity last fall uh, that uh, over the last 50 years we've lost about a third of our birds. 
So we can contribute to this. And uh, with that last point, adding habitat at home may spur us to act to protect the environment on a larger scale. You may maybe read this book. You may uh, know, probably know Douglas Tallamy, who's a professor of entomology at uh, Delaware. This is his second book. I'll get to the first later. But uh, Tallamy has made the proposal that uh, conservation starts in your yard. Uh, in this day and age, uh, politically and economically, we don't have much say over how that land is managed, but we do control our own yard. And collectively then, this could be uh, an important uh, contribution to uh, protecting birds. All right, so what do birds need? In, in broad ecological terms, they need, need food, shelter, water, and nest sites. I'll be talking mainly about food tonight, but the others in passing. Uh, I like to add that they like peace and quiet too, because the, the busyness of the human economy, whether it's on foot or in vehicles uh, or in machinery is a, uh, a problem for birds worldwide. All right, this is the most important slide of the evening. If you remember nothing else, uh, you want to use a diversity of native plants, but we're going to uh, break that out here uh, and uh, explain a number of aspects. You eventually can pick and choose which ones you think you can use uh, in your situation. So I break diversity out into structural and biological components. Obviously, if you've got a diversity of plants, you're going to have both of those issues, but we'll talk about it in more detail. And then I'll make the case uh, for using native plants. So I said that uh, we simplify landscapes, and so we want, want to start adding complexity back. And the first thing we'll do is to uh, use a variety of uh, big and small plants, uh, narrow and broad, uh, to break up the landscape. And what we want to do is to not only think of the square footage we've got, but to use as much of the third dimension uh, going upward as we can, because birds differ in preference. So going, you'll see this slide more than once is that uh, there's not much complexity here. Uh, I will be using my own place uh, for a number of examples here, which is a little unfair because I've got uh, three and a half acres. But uh, back here, I hope you can all see the laser pointer, but back here on the line of alders is Oak Creek. So there's alders and ashes down there. We've got some 110 year old Oregon white oak here, I, these Douglas fir are much bigger now. I, I was trying to estimate them today. Uh, they're probably 50 or 60 feet tall. And then there's a variety of uh, trees and shrubs working down from that point up to the house uh, where the lower shrubs are. So in that landscape, then birds like the warbling vireo on the left, the Wilson's warbler on the right, will tend to be in the lower half of this landscape. They want their feet closer to the ground. Uh, whereas birds like the black-throated gray warbler and Townsend's warbler will usually be found uh, farther up in the canopy. All right, so here's a, uh, a example of a landscape that has no native plants in it, as far as I can tell, but it has pretty good structural complexity. So the best I can say for it is that if these people wanted to feed birds, they'd have a situation where uh, the birds felt safe and a variety of species might find their way in there. Uh, I took this photo and then later noticed uh, old Tabby here. And so I will just uh, note that birds, outdoor, outdoor cats are a big problem for birds. All right, the second aspect of this structural complexity then is to tie it all together uh, with a continuity of plants from understory to canopy. Uh, I like to quote this uh, Mr. Williams, I've forgotten his first name. He lives down in the lower Rio Grande Valley, which is a very interesting, basically Mexican part of the world. And uh, Lena and I have been there twice to bird. It's a, it's a world birding destination. It's mostly, however, urban and agricultural landscapes. So it's highly modified, but anywhere that you have an oasis of native plants, then the birds flock in there. And his place 
then uh, it seems to have a fairly reliable trickle of, of great Mexican species coming in. So people visit his yard to see these. We have not been there yet, but I quote that authority that I think the continuity of plants uh, from the understory on up is a big part of the success of this yard. So that again, no continuity here, but in this situation back at Oak, my place on Oak Creek is that birds can move around wherever they feel comfortable in that uh, three-dimensional space. Uh, in the winter, it looks something like this and birds that don't come to the feeder can loaf there or hide there or look for whatever they feed on back in there. Uh, and so then this continuity relates then to a feeder operation, and that is you don't want the feeder to be very far from safety uh, so that you need to give the little birds a chance. Uh, you'll see a slide later uh, where these mugos have disappeared and uh, we've got a new generation of plants in here. But the point then of the safety is that short, uh, sharp shinned hawks and cooper's hawks know where feeders are and they uh, check them constantly. They check ours constantly. As far as we know, they've only caught one bird in 40 years at our place. Even though they have to eat, they're finding their food somewhere else. All right, so moving, oops, I have to get my left hand ahead of my right. There we go. Uh, I have, uh, I, I show this in various ways, but uh, three categories of birds here, four really. This, this left hand column are basic feeder birds. So they would be visiting the uh, feeders uh, there. Uh, but even though we think of them as seed eaters, they still rely on uh, a lot of insects to uh, raise their, to survive themselves and to raise a brood. Uh, we see uh, this middle column of birds are not uh, uh, feeder birds, mostly. There are some occasional exceptions and issues there, but uh, they'll mostly be hanging around on the outside uh, watching what's going on at the feeders, but they're eating something else, fruit and insects. Uh, the last column here, warblers, tanagers, vireos, and flycatchers are almost strictly insect eaters. This is a really exciting time of the year for people like me because we're approaching the peak of spring migration where all these little guys are coming up from their winter in Mexico and uh, almost every day you see something new. Uh, hummingbirds and bees are a little bit different. I, I call bees honorary hummingbirds, but the, the hummingbirds are a little bit different breed of cat. We would garden with the same principles, but think of a different set of plants. All right, the uh, third point of restoring complexity is what I call clutter. And this is something that often gives, uh, gives many people a visceral revulsion. Uh, because uh, humans uh, relentlessly want to tidy. We have a very strong drive to neaten things up. Uh, but this is a vitally important part of the food web. That uh, uh, Decay organisms create a whole part of the uh, food chain, uh, support a whole part of the food chain, and by uh, taking dead wood out of the system, then we're... Uh, uh, compromising the ecological productivity uh, substantially. Uh, every year we read about something like this. If somebody wants to let their lawn grow or uh, worse yet, they install a prairie back in Wisconsin or Ohio or somewhere and the neighbors go nuts. Uh, so the, the, the neighbors, the neighborhood association, uh, the city, the lawyers get involved and eventually the poor guy that wants to uh, uh, produce some habitat uh, has to has to take it out. Uh, even in Seattle, several years ago, some some beavers got into one of the uh, city parks and uh, started doing what beavers do, making a mess. Beavers, uh, as you probably know, are tremendously important ecologically. They're considered to be a keystone species by adding uh, so much complexity to the habitat. But uh, a number of uh, citizens said that uh, we don't like this mess. Well, fortunately, the city, city hung in there, but it's a very difficult 
uh, attitude to, to get over. So uh, think about the uh, billions of person hours in taking leave, breaking leaves up or blowing leaves every fall, the millions of gallons of fuel uh, that go into that when we could leave them in place or nearly in place and uh, have a fundamental part of the food chain. Uh, likewise, leaving uh, prunings around in, uh, in piles. These are gold mines of activity for a variety of species. Uh, you can think of using dead wood in imaginative ways. Uh, a number of years ago, I guess back in 2003, uh, we had a little bit of landscaping done to kick it up a notch. And uh, uh, Mike Riddle of Trillium, if you remember him, uh, put in these uh, chunks of wood. Well, they're gone now. They rotted out. But that's the point is that they fueled a chunk of the ecosystem. The stonework uh, was left with nooks and crannies, uh, places where invertebrates can hide and birds can search for a morsel. Uh, I'm fortunate in that I've got space to let trees die and uh, provide habitat. This old alder is gone, but it's uh, supported uh, a number of species over the years. Uh, I've got that nice little grovelet of old oaks that I, I thinned a number of years ago just to let them spread out a bit, uh, but I uh, girdled them. And so that then was uh, uh, brought in uh, pileated woodpeckers. So use this to the extent that you can, this dead wood. It doesn't have to be a safety hazard. It can be lying on the ground. It can be shortened so it uh, is unlikely to hurt the grandkids, whatever. But it's, it's an important uh, part of the system. Even the clutter in my greenhouse in a little gallon container several years ago uh, provided shelter for some Bewix wrens. Uh, these little guys fledged the next day. All right, another aspect of adding some complexity back to the landscape has to do with rain gardens, uh, where, as you know, that the, the main source of water pollution now that we've shut off sewage and industrial outflows into uh, rivers is non-point sources. And so many cities uh, and municipalities are trying to channel water into the ground before it even gets to the sewage plant or gets to streams. So then you can create a seasonal wetland uh, in this, in our environment, uh, where we have all of our rain in the wintertime, but it'd be a seasonal wetland and can support a suite of plants that you might not uh, find room for otherwise. Uh, and so that leads me into the idea of water. Even though we live on Oak Creek, we've got some water features uh, in the garden and birds use them routinely. This is a Wilson's warbler who was on his way south a few years ago and stopped to shake off the dust in the bath. Uh, this was taken last April. The, the spotted towhee in the upper left is a resident. The golden crowned sparrow is was on his way north. The orange crowned warbler on the lower left is a summer resident, uh, but they were all uh, using the, the bath, even in fairly cold, uh, chilly April weather, having a good old time. This is an Audubon's warbler in our stone water feature. And we have a dripper, yeah, mostly chickadees and nuthatches use that. All right, so we have these structural aspects uh, of the uh, adding complexity. Then uh, the biological aspects that I want to emphasize are that the mentality that I find useful, uh, maybe it's a sickness, but I, I, it's, it's still as important, I think, and that is that you want to be thinking not so much just adding plants to fill space and look good, but to think about the fact that you're creating a food web. Okay, and so that every plant that goes in uh, is contributing something to the system. So I start with this food web from Fundamentals of Ecology, which is a wonderful textbook. It shows that uh, plants capture sunlight, uh, some animals eat the plants, other animals eat those animals, and it's all recycled back through the decomposers and so forth. There's nothing wrong with this, but uh, the mental image I want you to have of your garden uh, the food web in your garden is something like this. Uh, this conveys the idea, even though it's a marine ecosystem, remember an ecosystem is an ecosystem in terms of basic uh, principles of function. 
So uh, three points. Uh, one is that when we add uh, the right plants into the system, then we're not just adding the plant, but there's a whole suite of organisms that associate with it in a variety of ways. Second point is that this, these complex systems are more ecologically productive overall, and then unless we introduce an invasive species that the system doesn't have a defense against, okay, like Dutch elm disease or chestnut blight or emerald ash borer or something like that, given that, then these are stable systems as well. Another aspect of biological diversity that I think of is what I call old growth, and that is as uh, trees and even people become older, other things start to grow on them. And the Oregon white oak is a wonderful example uh, where it uh, hosts, uh, in many cases, mistletoe, which is very important. Mistletoe berries are a great source of, uh, of food for bluebirds and yellow-rumped warblers and white-breasted nuthatches uh, in early winter before they scarf them all up. Uh, we've got here a uh, western bluebird who's probably been up in the mistletoe that day. Another, here's a white-breasted nuthatch. So besides the mistletoe, we've got tree moss, we've got lichens, we can have fern gardens on there. So it can be aesthetically wonderful. In fact, you know, I grew up in, in central Oregon, it was very dry. We didn't have uh, much growing on trees, uh, you know, no mistletoe, no lichen, no tree moss. Uh, we moved up here from California in the winter time and the, the lichen and the moss and the ferns on the trees just blew me away. I thought it was uh, a fabulous, uh, uh, landscape to be moving into, and it's good for your, your uh, ecosystem as well. Uh, this is a Douglas fir on campus. I haven't been, don't go through campus anymore, but it was a uh, wonderful character for a tree uh, over by Fairbanks Hall, and that uh, great rough craggy bark uh, over the years uh, must have been a, a, a hiding place or a breeding place for a variety of insects and invertebrates because it was very common that nuthatches or warblers or creepers were uh, combing the, the bark looking for morsels. All right, so in sum then, this uh, diversity produces a greater biomass of the things that birds can use. And so we've got the, uh, um, you know, yeah. I struggle with the laser pointer for some reason. It helps to click control. Here we go. So we've got the plant products. We've got the, the dead wood, which we're gonna figure out some way to tolerate and we're growing insects. All right, now in order to accomplish this, we wanna use native plants. Uh, by definition, they aren't gonna be invasive. They're locally adapted to climate and weather. They're recognized by the birds and insects as a place to make a living. They host several times more insect diversity and biomass than do non-native plants. Now, most entomologists, most biologists, uh, if they don't study it, they understand it. But Douglas Tallamy is the person who has uh, really professed this on a national scale. And this is his first book, Bringing Nature Home. So he spent his career documenting these disparities. And so as a general summary, we can say that if you're selecting a shrub or a tree for a particular spot, uh, and you have a choice of a native or a non-native, if you select the non-native, you're giving up 80 to 90% of the food web potential there. Why is this a problem? Well, insects are in serious trouble. A uh, number of our uh, articles, and it's hard to imagine. We would have thought that uh, humans would screw up and uh, insects would uh, take over the world after we'd left. But in fact, we've had a war on insects for a long time, especially since World War II. We've had increasingly effective chemicals to spray on massive long landscape scales, uh, and then our agricultural systems and so forth, and uh, insects are in trouble. Uh, as I say, we think of birds often as uh, seed eaters or fruit eaters, but they all need insects. Uh, one of the factoids I didn't want to forget, uh, Tallamy 
had a student uh, uh, observe uh, nesting chickadees and try to count the number of insects uh, that they brought home every day and that, uh, didn't read the paper, but I'll trust his uh, estimate that to raise a single check chickadee requires something on the order of six to 8,000 insects. So imagine the, the trillions or quadrillions of insects that we need to support a population of billions of birds. So what's native? Uh, Benton County and the Willamette Valley strictly, but all of us uh, expand our range uh, so the main thing is to uh, look at the plant, uh, think about what it has to contribute to the food chain in your garden. Don't worry too much about um, uh, whether it's strictly native to Benton County. Uh, and uh, I've forgotten why I included this again, so I'll keep moving. Oh, that's it. Uh, and I just want to uh, show you that, uh, remind you that the uh, this, this group of birds, the uh, neotropical migrants are coming in now, and this is the sort of thing that you can see. Uh, our black-throated gray warbler, he's back. Wilsons are back. Orange crown warblers have been back for a while now. Warbling vireo any day now. Western tanagers, yeah, in the next week or two. Flycatchers, this is a western wood pea. We fly catchers next month mostly, although some of the early ones are back now. All right, so that's the excitement that's going on now. And this is a passage from a poem called Swifts by the English poet Ted Hughes. He was uh, celebrating the joy that he found with the return of Swifts to his garden in England every year. But this passage, uh, it means a lot to me this time of year. So I'll read it. They've made it again which means the globe still working, the creation still waking refreshed, our summer still all to come. So we have a lot at stake with these birds, not just in terms of aesthetics and the joy of seeing them, but in keeping our ecosystems functioning. All right, so this slide is mainly for uh, non-birding audiences, your master gardeners, so you know that given a particular site, irrigation strategy and so forth that uh, all native plants may not be suitable for your garden. So you need to work through some of these issues. Uh, also for the, the non-gardening types, they uh, think that if they put some plants in then everything is stable, but it's not because weeds, mostly uh, invasive species will come in. So what's your plan to control weeds? All right, so let's look at a few plants and I'm going to really uh, move along here fairly quickly and we'll get you out uh, in time uh, before the taverns close tonight. Uh, let's look at this first from the standpoint of berries. And so I've listed some here, but the point I want to make is that they don't all flower and fruit at the same time. So an aspect of diversity is then to provide a buffet throughout as much of the year as you can. Uh, the first on that list, and pretty much the first shrub that flowers uh, in the winter is Indian plum. Used to flower mainly in February, it's January now, but when it comes out, even though the individual flowers are not really showy, collectively uh, they look really nice during the winter, and traditionally they're associated with the return of, of rufous hummingbirds. Uh, they produce these little uh, droops, uh, berries. They turn blue-black when they're ripe, uh, but the birds tend to scarf them up as, as quickly as, uh, as soon as they ripen. This red flowering currant is one of my favorites. Uh, it is, uh, I always think that it looks sensational. It's, it's blooming right now, and I'm, I'm looking at that uh, group of plants uh, out the window as I speak. Uh, and uh, this was uh, a, a real eye-opener for me. It's, uh, there are quite a number of selections, so you have a range of, of color types, mostly pinks and, and almost to reds, obviously a white cultivar. They produce some berries that the birds don't seem to be extremely fond of, but they must eat some because I find seedlings scattered around uh, where birds poop. Uh, it's a good hummingbird plant, but the real eye-opener for me was that it attracts this little warbler, uh, orange-crowned warbler. These are 
almost purely insect uh, feeders, but uh, this species is a nectar feeder. And so they have uh, been back three or four weeks now, uh, three weeks, and uh, they spend a lot of time gleaning for insects, but they periodically take a break and feed on the current. And there are uh, not many plants that will bring a, uh, a warbler right up to your window. We used to, when Aprils uh, were colder, have the occasional awful spring uh, April storm, and there's a little uh, orange crown uh, feeding in the, the muck there. Uh, about a, every April or so, we get a, an unusual uh, hummingbird, a calliope hummingbird, that, uh, whose range is from the Cascades uh, east in the mountains, but a few stray into the Willamette Valley. And about every 10 years or so, I, I see one in my garden, and it's always associated with the red flowering current. Uh, in this case, he's hiding deep in the, in the shrub uh, from the uh, bully Rufus, who will try to chase him off. Okay, a number of other uh, native shrubs that are great wildlife plants. We have choke cherry, a good floral display. It's a, a tall, narrow plant. It suckers quite a bit, so you want to take that into consideration. It will form a thicket. Uh, service berry is a great plant, uh, a different form uh, than uh, choke cherry in terms of design produces fruits that uh, birds can't get enough of. Uh, a service berry with ripe fruit will be full of birds. Uh, cascara is uh, one of my current favorites, uh, this and the, uh, the current. Uh, it's not a uh, brilliant ornamental. There's nothing particularly objectionable, but it's not showy. Uh, it flowers over a fairly long period of time and so the fruit ripen over a period of time uh, in the late summer and into September. But the uh, birds will be checking through uh, routinely to find ripe fruit. They, they really uh, seek them out. Uh, even when there are not fruit, the birds are in using cascara looking for insects. So it must host, host a pretty good population of insects. Uh, last summer, all of these species of birds use the cascara that I can see from the deck. These photos weren't all taken that week, but uh, we had cedar waxwing, purple finch, western tanager. This is a juvenile, so he looks a little funny. Uh, Black-headed grosbeak and Swainson's thrush. So uh, a steady flow of action through a cascara. Uh, we have Douglas hawthorn or Oregon hawthorn, which is another great plant. The birds uh, love the fruit. Uh, there are uh, they also it's it's a great place to find birds in a in a hawthorn thicket, even if they don't have fruit. Uh, American dogwoods in general are kind of in trouble from introduced diseases, uh, and so Pacific dogwood is not easy to grow, but it's a great plant. Uh, well worth giving a shot. It's shrubby counterparts, very common. We've got uh, a number of vaccinium species uh, native here. The evergreen huckleberry is very ornamental. And the deciduous types uh, here are nice uh, with uh, a little bit of dead wood there. Elderberries are great. This uh, plant is flowering right now. I'm looking at it. It's much bigger, quite a bit bigger than uh, this plant now. Uh, produces a nice crop of red berries that the birds go after. Uh, Black-headed grosbeaks, for some reason, eat a lot of green fruit. I don't know what they get out of it, but uh, most of the uh, fruit from this plant disappear before they, they ripen. Blue elderberry is a, a bigger, coarser plant. Uh, but the birds avidly eat that fruit when it ripens in September, October. California wild grape is one that is not quite native here. It gets up into at least Douglas County, if not Southern Lane County. And I planted it in that big Douglas fir you saw earlier down by the creek uh, to add some structural complexity and another source of fruit. So it, those uh, vines now are producing a lot of fruit. They, in, the, in our normal summer, uh, 
it, they, they don't get enough heat, so they don't all ripen, and then they tend to ripen in the second half of October. If we get a really hot summer, then they ripen earlier and, and a much higher percentage ripen, but the birds really go for them. So we've got, uh, this is a, another Swainson's thrush, but usually the hermit thrushes are back uh, in the garden by the time the, the fruit are still around, robins, tanagers. Uh, eat them. The uh, bantail pigeons like them. Even the pileated woodpecker come through. Uh, this fellow had been checking for ripe grapes. Uh, couldn't find one, so he settled for a choke cherry instead. Pacific madrone. This is another one of those plants that, uh, as a as an east sider, just blew me away. It looks so exotic and wonderful. I think it's very ornamental. Uh, it's somewhat messy, can be a bit difficult to grow, uh, but a great plant. Uh, here is a, uh, an Anna's hummingbird feeding on the flowers of the madrone. I took the photo this morning down at Bald Hill. Pacific wax burl, mainly a coastal species. Uh, its vegetative characteristics, I think, are nice. It's a very irregular plant, but I think uh, attractive foliage. It produces uh, these uh, small waxy fruit and waxes are a problem for many uh, vertebrate organisms to process, but uh, the yellow rumped warbler uh, uh, can do that. One of the subspecies of yellow rumped warbler is called myrtle warbler in recognition of the fact that they can use these fruit. You recognize this as poison oak. And so now I'm being a, a, a real jerk here, but uh, I'm trying to, uh, radicalize people and, and drag you as far down the path of using natives as possible. Uh, even poison oak is host to a number of Lepidoptera. It produces a great crop of fruit and there's our little uh, yellow rumped warbler again uh, processing them. I am sensitive to poison oak but I, uh, I keep some around in the further reaches of our property just as a component of um, of diversity. And along those lines, I don't have time to talk about perennials tonight, but this is one that I keep around as well, stinging nettle. You see that there is some insect larva that is shredding those leaves. And in fact, there are some uh, obscure Lepidoptera that uh, uh, use nettle as a host. But one, I think it's the uh, painted lady will use uh, stinging nettle as well. And these Lepidoptera are what we want to have around for our birds. All right, so those I focused mainly on fruit species. We have a bunch of other uh, uh, natives. I'll just go through these quickly. We have our own azalea. Uh, we've got uh, a number of ceanothus. I'll show three of them here that are great bee plants, uh, and they also host a number of Lepidoptera. Manzanitas, I think, are another iconic Western plant. We have uh, a number of species uh, that can grow here. Uh, I like the look of them. They're very drought resistant. Uh, they flower in, uh, from mid-winter into early spring, and the hummingbirds uh, use them, both the annas and the rufus. Garia are uh, the silk tassels, they are dioecious, so they have male plants and female plants. The males uh, have these ornamental catkins. There are selections of garia for that, and the females have fruit. Uh, we have vine maple, which is our counterpart of the Japanese maple. I still have a few Japanese maples around, but uh, they're being grandfathered out, and uh, vine maple being substituted instead. We have three species of Mahonia. Basically, uh, the aquafolium is the state flower, but all three you can uh, lump into that category. So wonderful bright yellow flowers, the blueberries, and a variety of shapes and textures on those leaves. Mock orange, wonderfully fragrant plant. Ocean spray is probably the last to flower in, in June. Attractive. So we have a, a wide palette of plants to choose from. Uh, the Northwest is thought of as conifer country, so we've got a bunch of those. Some of them for smaller yards like shore pine. Mountain hemlock is smaller, or at least it grows more slowly. Uh, so we have options uh, if you have a small space. 
All right, so to summarize then, almost finished, uh, we, we love the Pacific Northwest uh, and we, we go out into the woods or uh, the savannas and it, we love the oaks and the Douglas fir and the maples and the, the patterns that it forms, but we don't always use those plants in our gardens. Uh, and one could ask well, then, why do we want our garden to look like someplace else uh, rather than uh, the, the Northwest, which we're so proud of? It really came home to me a couple of years ago when Lena and I were birding in Australia. And Australia has that fantastic uh, flora of the eucalyptus and the banksias and the grevilleas and on and on and on. They're spectacular plants uh, and a very strong statement of place. Uh, we went one day down with the guide down into Melbourne to a natural area to see a family of powerful owls, if you can imagine that. But on the way into town, uh, the neighborhoods struck me as, well, this could be anywhere. This could be North America. This could be Europe. And in fact, I pulled this off the web. Uh, this is a home site in Melbourne. Uh, and, and so it's a shame that uh, oftentimes we, we decide to select the uh, non-native plants and uh, we don't reflect our own sense of place and, by the way, help our own uh, birds and insects. So I'm gonna just finish up, almost done. And now this is the, uh, the feeding area with the native shrubs having superseded those, those mugo pines that I initially put in because they were cheap and free from my colleagues in the department. Uh, but they're gone now. And so one day, uh, oh, 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 right. So the native plants uh, have provided the, uh, the Saul going to Damascus moment for me. Uh, I would, my Damascus was gardening with rhododendrons and Japanese maples and conifers and so forth. But as I watched birds use my garden back in the 80s, they weren't interested in those other species. They were working on the natives. And uh, that's turned out to be a very important observation in my life. So an example occurred last summer. Now typically, in, uh, especially in fall migration, spring migration, birds are usually moving through fairly quickly, dispersing northwards or upwards. But in the fall, they're more leisurely and they just kind of work their way steadily through the yard. But uh, a pair of uh, black-throated gray warblers stopped for about an hour and they found plenty to eat. So uh, this was on an Oregon white oak. It's a small one that the jays planted, but it's, it's here until it gets too big. Uh, now it's on the dogwood, the Pacific dogwood. It's on the madrone. Uh, this is the cascara on the right, and then it turns around and there's a branch of uh, Philadelphia's mock orange, where he's actually, uh, it's hard to see here, but he grabbed a little thrips or something. Uh, it's on the vine maple. So the buffet was there and they actually spent some time using it and I could sit there from 10 feet away on my deck and enjoy it. We also have a whole suite of perennials to use. I'm not gonna show that tonight, but uh, a bunch of wonderful, colorful plants that are great for insects. So I, I'm crediting uh, as usual, I'm still using some of Pat Breen's slides uh, from his website. I think, I hope many of you still remember Pat uh, he's been retired for a while. I learned just Saturday that two weeks ago, Pat fell off his bike again and broke his hip. So he's recovering, but he's his usual cheerful self and we wish him well. Uh, so in summary, remember that we want to develop a structural and biological diversity of native plants. And within that set of ideas, then there's an infinite number of, of insect and plant insect and bird relationships and remember to keep your brain active that's it thank you very much thanks very much bill very interesting talk um i someday i'm gonna have to visit your yard because uh i have about twice as much land as you and you may have managed to cram in a heck of a lot more diversity than i have so well, it was really neat off, to see that. Work, work off of that framework. Because that's, that's another point is that uh, all of us, even I, bring in the occasional non-native plant, but it's a, an intensively native 
context, if I can put it that way. So you've got a lot to work with. I crammed another 300 uh, trees of three species into the place this winter. So. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <Stop. laughs> It's no wonder you volunteered to do some of the gardening down at uh, the Finley Refuge. It gives you even more uh, territory to play with, doesn't it? Not just the little right. it's another. It's another sandbox. <laughs> That's great. Uh, if anyone has questions for Bill, uh, please use the chat function. Again, that uh, button is down at the bottom of your screen and type in a message. Make sure you're sending it to uh, all panelists and attendees so we can see the question. And... Uh, Bill, you can either read the questions or I can read them to you as you prefer. And well, I think since I'm, I think since I started sharing the screen, I have lost the chat button. So okay. I'm going to have to, I'm going to, I'm going to have to depend on you. All right. So if anyone has questions, please type them into the chat box now. Hit the enter or return key, and I will relay them to Bill. I found, is this something from Nancy Tovar? Oh, it just came in. I found the chat button and it hidden away. And she says she has an acreage in Oak Ridge that used to be a Christmas tree farm. Uh, all that's left are a couple of dozen cedars and four apples. What would be some good drought tolerant natives to include? Elk are a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, off the top of my head, you know, if, it's, if it's a Christmas tree farm, the soil is probably pretty good. Uh, so there's not much limitation, but the, uh, other than the elk. Uh, so that, Have you ever had a problem with residual herbicides in Christmas tree lo uh, lots? I don't know. I, yeah, I have no idea. I haven't heard of that. Uh, do they use... Uh, uh, pre-emergent herbicides? Uh, not pre-emergent, no. Okay. Do they have, do they use herbicides that have much residual? I don't know. I, I'm not sure what's currently used. Um, yeah. So one, one you might, might try would be cascara. And the only reason that comes off the top of my head is that, um, that is a plant that was a, uh, used as a medicinal by the Native Americans, and it actually was a uh, was harvested extensively in more modern times. Uh, the bark was used as a laxative, uh, and it's around here. I don't have. I, we've got plenty of deer, but they don't seem to create much problem for me in terms of browsing because there's. I guess there's so much choice. No, no particular plant gets hammered, but uh, cascara strikes me as a plant that is pretty resistant to that. But on the, the other side, uh, they seem to like almost anything in the rose family. Uh, so that would be a problem for choke cherry and Indian plum and the hawthorns and so forth. Um, uh, so I don't know, that would be a start. Put up a fence. <laughs> That's something I know the Nature Conservancy has had to do at places like Zumwalt Prairie uh, to preserve some of the vegetation is to put up uh, elk exclusion fences. Mm-hmm, yeah. Kathy Clark says that uh, FYI to our members, a new garden at the fairgrounds is being developed based on Italian books. The other new garden is based on the theme of feeding local and migratory birds. So that's great, help evangelize the word. Uh, question, do you need both male and female garia for them to be useful for birds? Well, if you want fruit, uh, yes, but strictly as a host for insects, no, either side should be fine. Now, since I tend to want fruit, uh, I tend to, I assume, I, most of the breeding systems, the incompatibility systems for other than apple and cherry and, and cultivated crops are not known because, you know, for apples, you need to have a a compatible set, uh, set of uh, pollen to, to uh, fertilize the, the eggs, but uh, that's not known for currants and Gary and so forth. But uh, I, I tend to plant several. Uh, 
uh, of each species just to overcome the uh, possibility of, uh, well, to, to, and to ensure that I get uh, compatible pollen. Uh, so uh, I put as many of, of both out as possible to ensure fruit, not just for the reason that uh, Kathleen is talking about here. I started out with one red flowering current and it wasn't setting fruit. So I uh, collected a bunch of them and now I've got plenty of fruit, more than the birds can eat. <laughs> okay. Marge, there is so much promotion of pollinator plants with good reason. We hear way less about specific plants that will host insects without being destroyed entirely by them. Any favorite plants you recommend? So there seem like two questions there. Pollinators, or two points, pollinators, but insects destroying them like the, uh, like Lepidoptera or something. Uh, I wish I could see plants destroyed by Lepidoptera because then I'd know that there was plenty, <laughs> plenty of bird food out there, uh, but that's fairly rare. Uh, I haven't had a uh, milk, uh, a monarch su successfully uh, hatch an egg on my milkweed yet, so I haven't seen that. Uh, so I don't um, see it as a particular point. But in terms of pollinating plants, <clears throat> uh, oh gosh, uh, any of the natives are always sought after, and even even good non-natives. So I have a a pretty big garden down at the Methodist Church on Monroe Street. And so most of the native perennials uh, flower in April and May. And so then after that, the, pollen, the perennials that are flowering are things like uh, Goldsturm, uh, Rebecca, and uh, Gara, and uh, Leatris, and you know, prairie type plants. And they're all very popular, especially the compositae are really popular with pollinators. Uh, the milkweeds are very attractive to insects. Uh, so just about anything that you can think of. And so that reminds me here. I'll go ahead and show you a, a slide that I didn't use otherwise tonight. And uh, okay, this is a test garden of, of annual and perennial plants down at OSU, taken several years ago. And uh, these are selected for their showiness. Uh, and for nothing else, as far as I know. Uh, there was not a bee to be found in that garden other than a few on some of the salvia selections. Uh, but they had, for whatever reason, uh, had not, uh, I mean, there can be various reasons that you can lose pollen and nectar uh, resources, but they obviously hadn't been selecting that in the breeding process. Whereas we go on to all of our native perennials and they're great. Do you see uh, Kathleen Rochester's question? Uh, is it true that Nandina berries are uh, dangerous for the birds around here? I, yeah, I don't see, I've lost that again. Um, okay, to, to repeat, uh, okay. she asks, is it true that Nandina berries are dangerous for the yeah. birds around here? Yeah, I, that question surged, sur circulated through the uh, birding community a couple of years ago and um, Maybe modestly, yeah, modestly dangerous. Mm -hmm. We didn't, nobody really knew for sure, but uh, it, it, it's, worth, it's worth being cautious about it. Let's see here, see if I can find my, uh, here. No, I've lost my control panel. <laughs> so you'll have to interpret for me, Alan. Okay. Uh, Kathleen's was the last question I've received. Okay, I've got it back. All right. So I'll make a last call for questions for Bill. Uh, Brooke is recording this presentation. Uh, and I assume it'll be made available. Uh, so it'll give pe people a chance to watch it again. And uh, if they have more questions, then I'm sure we'll have a way of uh, getting in touch with uh, Bill and, and contacting him. Um,
Uh, Jana has just, ah. Jana says, thank you, Bill. I've made note of several plants to add to my garden. You betcha. Go for it, Jana. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I hope, I hope you look at your gardens in a whole new way now. <laughs> okay. And Brooke says that she'll be sending the recording to Rich Taylor, and that will be posted on the uh, Master Gardener Association website. So, uh, Bill, thanks very much for your yeah. talk. Uh, very interesting approach to uh, how we ought to be looking at our gardens and uh, selecting what new to plant out there uh, for those of us who enjoy both uh, the gardens and the birds. Thanks very much. And Brooke, thank you for uh, helping to run the meeting tonight. Uh, your technical skills have been valuable. Uh, I very much consider myself a rookie with this process and couldn't have done it without your help. Uh, you did a so, great job. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight uh, to this first of the virtual meetings. Um, I welcome your feedback. Uh, again, I'm Alan Taylor, the Vice President for Programs, and you'll be able to find my email address in the uh, directory. And uh, uh, I have a, another program planned for May, uh, and that would be Erica Cherno, who is the uh, horticulture agent uh, new in uh, Lane County. She'll be talking about summer pruning of uh, fruit trees. And uh, with that, I will say good night to everyone. Don't okay. driving home and no goodies. <laughs> good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, Bill.